and welcome to Vintage Tech Time on Dielectric Videos. So last weekend I was out garage sailing and I came across this Olsen AM323A amplifier. It's a solid state amplifier, meaning it's transistorized, and I really uh, was out looking for a cool chassis for my future tube amplifier. You probably saw my previous video <clears throat> where I uh, showed you the inner workings of my very first uh, experimental test of a tube amplifier. And I came across this. Uh, the sticker said only 10 bucks, and it's got a solid wood chassis with this beautiful silver front panel and these, uh, these knob controls on it. And I said, well, I will take this because I'm going to build a tube amplifier out of it. Well, when I got home, I was actually quite surprised to find that it actually worked as an amplifier. So for that reason, I've actually decided that perhaps I will keep this as an original transistor amplifier. Now that's especially true because I noted that online, in good condition, these can go for north of $100 a piece. And that's way too good to pass up uh, to just use it for parts. However, when I first bought it, it wasn't exactly without its faults. Uh, I noticed the uh, there were, there's a little bit of a bias towards one speaker over the other. The left speaker is a little stronger than the other, so you have to compensate it with the balance knob a bit to make it sound good. And also I noticed that on the selector, the only input that works really well is the aux input, the auxiliary input. The tuner input on the back, uh, well I don't have any sound going through it now, but what I can, I'll describe to you the issues. Uh, the tuner input only plays on one speaker. And if you move, wiggle this knob a little bit, it'll come through on both, but it's kind of intermittent. Uh, I suspect a little bit of contact cleaner might improve that. Surprisingly, the volume control is pretty clean. I didn't have any real issues with crackle on the volume. Uh, the bass and treble work nicely. You can adjust how, uh, how much bass response and treble response uh, you get out of it. And it's got a few other settings. You can choose whether the high is cut out or cut in, low is cut out or cut in. It does include a tape monitor, which is a pass-through circuit. I'll show you that on the back in a minute. You can choose between stereo out and mono out, depending on whether your input signal is stereo or mono. It's got power and speaker uh, on-off, headphone out, and it also has a pre-amplifier for a phonograph. It has, uh, I'm not sure what XTAL means, I'm sure the audiophiles out there know exactly what that is, and presumably magnetic, I guess those are different types of turntable control, uh, of some kind, and of course it has a tape input for your tape deck. Now there's the other issue, uh, you can probably hear if I'm quiet for a second. There's a lot of hiss and crackle on the tape input. Now all of these inputs do work to an extent, but the auxiliary input actually works best. So when I play some music for you, uh, I'm going to keep it on auxiliary because that seems to be the cleanest input. Uh, I am eventually actually planning on doing a full uh, overhaul to try to improve some of the sound on this, change the input filter capacitors, because there is a little bit of mains hum coming through, and see if I can figure out what the deal is with the weaker channel, and see if I can clean up this selector knob a bit. Now I'll show you the inputs on the back, because that's also quite fascinating. So here are our audio inputs. We have the auxiliary, which is where I have my cable plugged in right now. There's a stereo record player input uh, for the X-Tau and the MAG, both of which, uh, all of which have left and right channels. There's a pass-through tape recorder connection, which uh, has the recording and the monitor out. And uh, there's also a spot for a tuner and a stereo tape player, which I guess are equ roughly equivalent inputs to the aux in. On top of that, uh, there's also power on the back, which I was really fascinated with. I don't think I'd ever seen this in this configuration. An unswitched up to 300 watt power output here, and a switched up to 100 watt power output, which is connected via the front panel switch. So that means you can plug other audio gear in to the back of this, and then other things into the, that audio gear, and you can turn it all on and off with the flip of a switch. Very clever. So without further ado, I will play some audio on it and you can see, uh, obviously you won't be able to hear uh, through your speakers quite what I'm hearing, but I'll demonstrate it is quite a powerful and good sounding amplifier. It really rivals the Class D amplifiers with the uh, switched mode internal circuitry that they have nowadays. So I'll turn this down so I don't get too much crackle when I plug it into my audio source. 
and I will turn up the sound now. So now that you've heard it crank, you can tell it's a very nice high-powered amplifier. Uh, it does sound good, the bass and treble response both work. As you saw, I played around with a few settings, I tried turning the speakers off and on, I tried uh, changing it between stereo and mono, I haven't tried very much with the high cut, low cut, uh, it just adjusts the bass and treble response a little bit. Uh, and the loudness control, that's designed to actually improve the low frequency and high frequency response when the volume is low. You'll probably, I can actually show you how that works right now. So that just kind of improves the richness of the sound. Now, I didn't really give you guys a good look at the front panel yet, so I'll kind of move that towards the camera so you can see all the inputs. And as you can see, it's pretty comprehensive. It's got a lot of buttons and knobs and things to move. And in case you're wondering about the power output, presumably, according to the label, this is a 110 watt amplifier. So that's a pretty big beast, presumably 55 watts per channel peak power and it says it draws up to 160 watts at 117 volts AC. Oddly specific voltage, but uh, I guess that's just the nameplate nominal voltage for the input. But yeah, pretty nice amplifier and certainly worth it for 10 bucks. And I think uh, in the second part of this video, I'll show you guys the inside and walk you through how it works and what I plan on fixing in the future. So I'll be back in a moment. All right, so I've removed the cover from it, and as you can see, it says, no user serviceable parts. Ah, oh, well, we'll see about that. Anyway, this is what it looks like on the inside. You can see the whole thing is basically wires soldered across to junction points, soldered to a circuit board that was obviously hand silk screened, not done by any, not done by any computer like they do nowadays. Uh, you see the power transistors on the bottom. Uh, I looked these numbers up. These are actually PNP transistors. And here are the big guts of the system in here. So I'll go through it step by step and show you what everything does. So the first thing I'll show you is the power transformer. This is what uh, steps the 117 volts coming in. Must be 117. Not really, that's just what it says on the plate. But it steps the input voltage down to the requisite voltage for this board, which I measured is about 25 volts per side. Now, since this is a class B amplifier, or maybe actually a class AB amplifier, it has to have a push and a pull side. So between the two of these, there's actually 50 volts available, but it's split across two output rails. And they achieved that by having the rectifier center tapped and grounded to the center tap of this transformer. That makes it so that with a common ground in the middle, you can have plus 25 volts and minus 25 volts on either side. So that's uh, our power supply, and these capacitors, I suspect, may need to be changed because uh, I was getting a little bit of mains hum on the speaker output. So the next thing you'll notice is this circuit board. It looks like it has two small audio transformers on it, and uh, it also has a bunch of capacitors and many, many resistors. Uh, as, as well as a few small CAN-type transistors. Now this is the preamplification and uh, frequency response board. This is the part that preamplifies the signals coming in 
and adjusts the bass, frequency, uh, bass and treble frequency response as well as the volume and the other miscellaneous functions on the front. Once the audio comes out of here, it goes through these wires to the main output amplification stages, of which there are four, two per channel. You have the push and the pull for each channel. And the input control, which is the knob that was making all those uh, crackling and cutout noises when I turn it, is back here connected via this, uh, this connecting rod to the front. Now, I plan on putting some contact cleaner on here, uh, on this input uh, wire set here and this, these sliders here, in order to make sure that it's really making good contact. I suspect that's why I'm getting some crackle and hiss when I turn the knob. Uh, and if I, if I can recover that, that should really improve the uh, usability of this as an actual piece of hi-fi equipment. And interestingly, there are three circuit breakers, one for each amplifier and a main AC input circuit breaker. I suppose that's to protect to make sure that the system is not overloaded to the point of damaging the power transistors. And you can see each one has a, uh, a, res a large, very low value resistor. It looks like these say 0 0.68 ohms. I suppose these are just to make sure that there's no transient damage to the transistors when the thing turns on or turns off. Lastly, of course, there's a little light bulb for the indicator on the front, and I will actually show you what it looks like when that is powered on. So give me a moment to plug it in, and you'll see the light turn on. All right, and as you can see, the bulb has lit, and now the amplifier is powered. Now, I haven't hooked anything up to it because I already showed you in the previous part of this video how it works. But you can see it doesn't look much different when it's powered on. Simply the, uh, the light being on is the only other major difference. I do want to be a little bit careful, though, of this particular junction here because that is the mains 120 volts, and it's about maybe a two or three millimeters from that heat sink's uh, heat spreader. So definitely a good idea not to flex the chassis too much. So yeah, this is the inside of the amplifier. Uh, in the future, I plan on working on this a bit more, maybe uh, improving the uh, contacts on this uh, swipe control here, and probably replacing some of these capacitors if they are in fact bad. So thank you for watching Vintage Tech Time on Dielectric Videos. See you next time.